So I'd like to uh, begin by thanking uh, and echoing what Jason said. It's been, I, I've really enjoyed the workshop over the last day, and I'd like to thank the organizing committee for, for doing this. I know these things don't just happen on their own. I'm hearing behind the scenes, if I like thank John, uh, he's sort of been uh, a real leader in the field of biofouling for now, I've known over for over 20 years now. And I think behind the scenes, Claire Grandison seems to be doing a lot of things to make sure all this happens, so I'd like to thank them. So I'll begin today what sort of laying out what I see to be our knowledge, at least hydromechanically, and that's going to be the, sort of the theme this morning of what, what we know about the biofouling uh, impact. So I'll begin by looking at uh, what I'll say is the current knowledge and then talk about the gaps that we have in, in that knowledge and look at how we might uh, move ahead in, in that regard to try to answer those. So I think yesterday John did a very nice job in his opening uh, talk really laying out why we're all here. Uh, I, I guess since man has went to sea, he's learned that uh, marine growth has been sort of the bane of his existence. And so we've been fighting this for you know over 2,000 years now. I think there's some great reviews on the hydrodynamic work. Uh, First, marine fouling and its prevention, which John also alluded to, that's now 65 years old, but sort of as a cl classic sort of uh, case, and now uh, more recent work. But what I hope to, to leave you with today is at least my thoughts on what I think the state of the knowledge is and uh, where the shortcomings are when it comes to the hull fouling penalty. So I'll begin with, with this. Uh, the, the work has been referred to quite a lot. It's uh, some work that we, I did about 10 years ago now. Um, so we did some towing tank experiments over the period of about three years, uh, looking at uh, clean panels, looking at uh, panels that had been exposed to biofouling and those that had been cleaned back. We published that work in a fluids journal, but at the bequest of Maureen Callow, she says, well, nobody in the communities really pays, reads those journals. And so how, what does it really mean for a ship? Can you tell me what all, this, uh, all these towing tank results really mean on, on ship scale? And so she was really the, the impetus for then taking that and trying to boil it down. But in doing that, one thing I should stress is that this really just represents the spectrum of likely fouling impact. There's really no condition that we can point to that is exactly any of these conditions. And it's based on drag tests that were largely on uniformly fouled plates. And we know from looking at ship hulls, they're very rarely uniformly fouled. The other, I guess, caveat to this whole thing is they're, they were based on my experiences from towing tank tests for fouling that had been grown in the Chesapeake Bay. If we're here in Port Phillip Bay, you would have a completely different fouling community. What hard fouling is here is different than what it is in the Chesapeake Bay. So all these things sort of makes it where you need to take this with a little bit of trepidation, okay? It just really forms the, the spectrum, I'll say, of what the fouling impacts could be. What we have here, we sort of force them into what, the way the Navy rates their fouling, and we'll talk about that again in the next slide. Oh, the next uh, column there is the KS, the equivalent sand roughness height. That's the effective uh, roughness height uh, in a hydraulic sense of the different uh, fouling types. And then RT50 is just a notional thought of how big physically the, the different fouling types, types are. So I alluded to it, and I apologize, it didn't come out very well in sort of an eye chart here, but this is the Naval Ships Technical Manual Chapter 081 uh, fouling rating, and we've heard several speakers refer to it. I guess the take home here is that um, all the categories from FR 0 to 30 are either no fouling or soft fouling, and then above 40 and above start to get into calcareous fouling. And th the reason this is important is the Navy really ignores, in terms of cleaning, uh, anything 30 or below, and you have to have a fouling rating of 40. In other words, you have to have calcareous fouling before the Navy's interested in, hey, we might want to clean. And then even then, there needs to be 20% coverage. So it's not altogether clear to me that, you know, we should be ignoring soft fouling. And number two, where did 20% come from? So those are all questions I think that we need to try to address. So to do that, based on what, what I have, 
Uh, then at the request of my uh, program officer, Dr. Steve McIlvaney, which many of you are probably are aware of and know quite well, he sort of twisted my arm and says, you know, this is all fine and great, but to, to, to sell these programs and to look at cost benefit analysis, we need to bring some economics to bear on this. And so this was a nice collaboration that I had with the Naval Surface Warfare Center, particularly Eric Holm. Uh, the other uh, people who worked with were John Bendick, who really did the heavy lifting on this. Eric and I wrote, uh, wrote the paper, but he largely did most of the data analysis. We took the, the work that I'd done from the 2007 work and then really looked at uh, fleet operational data. So how often did the fleet steam at the different speeds? And we took that all into account uh, and used boundary layer similarity analysis to really look at the economic costs of the Hull fouling penalty. Uh, we looked at the Arleigh Burke class destroyer. Uh, it's the DDG-51. It's been in the news more lately for running into other ships than it has for anything else, but hopefully we can put that behind us. It represents about 30% of the U.S. fleet in terms of ships and about a quarter in terms of the total uh, hull area. Uh, these are the particulars of the ship here. Um, but what we found was when we do take the towing tank results and then scale that up, uh, we see that mainly the typical anti-fouling paints have fairly low penalties in that state. Uh, and then we move on up until if we're in the slime fouling regime, we're in somewhere in usually in the 10 to 20 percent, maybe, maybe not quite that much uh, penalty range. And then the range can get, the penalties can get quite large, but it should be noted that, you know, when we see heavy calcareous fouling, the Navy's not letting their ships get, get to that point. We don't typically see ships that, that have that sort of fouling level. So based on the database of the ship underwater hull, uh, analysis over several years, we found that the typical level of the fouling was this uh, fouling rating of 30. And if you remember back to what that means, that's sort of like moderate to heavy slime, but not really any calcareous fouling. And FR60 was really an upper bound of what we saw with any regularity. We didn't see FR, you know, 80 or 100. The, the, the Navy was not letting their ships get to that point. Uh, we also see that uh, the DDGs also supported pretty low levels of hard fouling, and a lot of this happening on like dock blocks and that sort of area. So that's an interesting area on how much impact that might be. So what we ended up finding was that when it was all said and done, this FR30 level really has an impact of about 10 percent. So if you look at the, the, the typical DDG-51 burns about $11 million in propulsive fuel a year, about $1 million of that uh, was going just to, to pay for having slime on the hull. Okay, so it probably is something that maybe make us take notice a little bit more. Uh, cleaning and painting costs, when it comes down to this prepared, compared to propulsive fuel, are really secondary things. So if you're able to develop a paint that really hydrodynamically performs much better, it's going to pay for itself very rapidly. And so these new technologies, cleaning technologies, paint technologies, all these things are relatively inexpensive compared to what we burn in propulsive fuel. So our real take home there was the slime fouling seems to form the basis of mostly what we see, but as rightly pointed out by Bob Townsend's paper in 2003, it's really the condition we understand the least. So we just recently looked at how can we look at uh, the slime fouling effect and look at that in a little more detail. Um, I probably should have run the other way. Slimes are a complete mess, okay, Hydro hydraulically or hydrodynamically. Uh, roughness is already a tough enough question in the turbulence community and there's always lots of c controversy when it comes to roughness and then you're going to take a roughness that has this complexity that it's, it's completely diverse in what it's made of, it's variable in density and height, it's compliant, and basically it can be altered by the flow. So over time you start with a certain experiment, you have this roughness, but as you do your experiment the roughness changes and all those things make life difficult. So what we aimed to do was we took a range of different fouling release coatings and wanted to document what their frictional drag penalties were. Um, we did that using natural marine biofilms that were made up of diatoms. 
Uh, we then took those results and predicted the drag and powering penalties of both the clean and the fouled coatings at ship scale. And hopefully this would let us have a better understanding of how the accumulation of this slime affects the performance. So this is sort of what I said there uh, in, in a little chart. Um, this was our technical approach to doing that. And the big thing is to try to develop the scaling and then also to then predict at full scale what the impact of the slime films would be. This is the experimental facility we used. Uh, it was a relatively new one uh, at that time. Um, it is a uh, turbulent channel flow. So we basically have a channel that is, uh, it's a rectangular duct, if you will, that is 25 millimeters in height and 200 millimeters in width. And it has a, develop or a length of about three meters. And the top and bottom walls, we form with these plates that are the plates of interest, the plates that we can have that are either uh, coatings or fouled with whatever fouling we're interested in. Uh, here are more of the particulars, but the, the take home from this is that we do relatively simple measurements. We measure the flow rate as accurately as we can, and we measure the pressure drop. And from that, we can infer what the wall shear is to a fairly high degree of accuracy. In order to grow the slimes, uh, we learned early on that slimes, you know, me being an engineer, I didn't know as much about slimes as I probably should have entering into this. We, we grew some under static conditions and we put them in the channel and everything just sort of sloughed off right away. And, oh, well, you can't do that. And, you know, you sort of wish you would have asked those questions earlier. You need to grow them dynamically. You need to expose them to shear. They will be much more tenacious if you do. So lo and behold, they were correct. Um, so we, had, we developed this drum. So it's a, basically an eight-sided drum, uh, and it, it basically is made up of eight different test plates uh, that we're interested in, and this drum rotates. And we can, the data I'm gonna show you here, we rotated it at four knots peripheral speed, but it creates some shear that the slimes grow under. And then if we take the slimes and then put them in the channel, then everything now doesn't, doesn't just slough off. This shows some representative results. These didn't come out the greatest. I should know better than this at this point in my career, showing pictures of fouled plates. It's never, never sh a good thing. So, anyway, but these are the different slime films we got. We had three different uh, fouling release coatings and an acrylic control. And these are the, the diatom genera that were present, amphora, navicula, so common uh, ship hull fouling diatoms. And this is the frictional drag result. So you think of this as the skin friction or the drag, if you will, and the Reynolds number. The one thing I can tell you about this, I, I like when I, we produce these curves, uh, I have to really watch when you put these into papers and biologists start grabbing these things. So what happens is this is what happened in my channel flow device, but you'll see the increases in friction here are on the order of what, 70% in some cases? And so they, people will want to run with that. Oh, well, Schultz found that 70% increase with slime films. Well, yes, in a one inch tall channel, it was 70% increase, but when you scale that to a ship, that's not the same thing. So you have to look at that with a little bit of trepidation. But what we see is we see this range of different performance for the different uh, coating types. One thing I'll note is I'm only showing the data from six month exposure. Uh, the data from three months look largely the same. Uh, the really, the, it made very little difference as to the time. These developed pretty rapidly, and, and basically three and six months were just the time points we chose to do the measurements. But I think in very short periods of time, you could get, get big impact. So this is really what we can get, okay? I was talking about how do we scale this to full scale. The way that's done, I don't know what some funny symbols come here with the Mac, but anyway, the delta U plus there should be the shift of the roughness function, the shift in the log layer, and the horizontal axis should be the roughness Reynolds number. And this shows all the data uh, shown on one plot. Now, somebody looking at this is from the turbulence community says this is a bit of a mess. Okay, this isn't really what you'd like to see. But if we start trying to break this down a little bit more, uh, what we find is that the, for the surfaces that are fully rough, uh, we f came up with a scaling, okay, it, Obviously, you know, we have two surfaces and you can draw a line through any two points, right? That's about what we're here. But anyway, it was a starting point. And we have a scaling that looks like it works, at least to some degree, that is based on both the uh, height of the uh, biofilm measured. We measured it with a paint wet film thickness gauge. 
and the percent cover of that biofilm on the surface. Um, we then looked at you know, the different surfaces that we had that had that. So these worked for the more heavy coverage. But then uh, things start to go a little bit south. Uh, we look at this on uh, the other, some of the other surfaces and we see uh, that it seems to do okay in predicting the onset of the roughness effects, which we see at a, at a roughness Reynolds number of about two or three. But we see this odd behavior where the roughness functions we would expect at high uh, unit Reynolds number for those to approach that solid line. That's what a normal roughness would do, and these aren't doing that. Uh, what we noticed was those were all surfaces where we had less than 25% cover of the, of the film. And so what might be happening there, we don't really know, but what might be happening is the flow might be reestablishing in some sort of quasi-smooth way in between these the islands of roughness, if you will. If we took the results, though, we can take this now, and I said using the, uh, the uh, roughness function, we can scale to ship scale. So if we do that again at both cruise and, and near top speed, these are the sort of penalties you see. So we get about a 10% increase for the worst case slime films. But the one thing I will note here is these are really, really moderate at most, okay? I would call these light to moderate slime films. What we're seeing for recent data, I'm not showing them here, where we get fluffy, more robust biofilms, which I don't know if those really exist on chip. So I'd, have to, I'd like to talk to some of the paint companies too to see what they see. But those things are showing equivalent sand roughness heights that are on the order of three or four times the physical height. And they're showing penalties that are up around the medium calcareous fouling level. So slimes might even be worse than this. These are very, very mild ones. So the next thing was, and I alluded to it earlier, is that uh, we, even with the hard fouling, the thing we don't know is that presently the Navy does a cleaning is triggered when we have 20% coverage of hard fouling. But at least in, in my mind, I don't know that that's underpinned at all by anything hydrodynamic. And so what we aimed to do then was to look at the role that, that the density of the fouling played. And to be simple, we use sort of simple barnacle shapes. This shows a result that's basically the equivalent sand roughness height normalized by the roughness height itself. And this is a result that's been quite known in the meteorological community where they're looking at isolated roughness elements. Uh, they're very commonly interested in things like cubes because they're interested in flow around like subdivisions and houses and that sort of thing. But what you see is with cubes, when you have a planned form density of around 15%, that's actually the maximum drag you can get. And if you start packing in cubes at higher levels than that, the drag actually drops due to sheltering. And it's sort of intuitive in some ways. You can imagine that as these cubes go towards 100% cover, you basically have another smooth wall that's just been displaced from the, from the original by the cube height, right? But does this hold for barnacles? We see the maximum at 15 to 20% coverage. So what does this look like for things like barnacles, which is what we want to know about? If this is true, that means that if this sort of behavior happens, waiting till 20% cover to clean is actually too late. Okay, you've already gotten, things are gonna get better from here based on this observation. If we get 100%, it would get better. But barnacles aren't cubes, so we have to remember that. So what we're doing is looking at a range of different uh, frictional drag for these barnacle arrays. Um, we hope that we can come up with some uh, guidance that will really allow revision of when we clean. So this is our, sort of approach, um, and I'll go more into it in the next few slides. Uh, it's basically to take different idealized barnacles, and it shows here. Now, I'm starting off with regular arrays. I realize that real barnacles don't form staggered regular arrays, but we have to crawl before we walk, and that's where we're starting. And so these are also not barnacles. They are truncated cones. We have tested real printed barnacles that are come from scans, we don't get results that really differ that much. So we don't think it's that important that they exactly look like barnacles. These don't. And for all the tests I'm showing here, our roughness height was fixed at a height of four millimeters. That was just out of convenience in the facility that we're using. Uh, this is some of the uh, experimental conditions. 
We get our measurements instead of the channel flow device or the towing tank that I talked about earlier. We did this in a boundary layer water tunnel. So we measured the velocity profiles using a laser Doppler velocimeter. Um, and we used some standard methods in the field to determine the wall shear stress. But this is what we see. And so right now, we've only tested up to 60% coverage of barnacles. We have all the way out towards 100%. But what we're seeing is, is that we're not uh, seeing the sort of cube type McDonald model results. We're seeing a monotonic increase and up to 60%, adding more barnacles is still adding drag. Now that's a little bit different. Uh, there's some classic work done in the literature by Kemp, who did towed these large pontoons in Germany in the 1930s. And he came up with this uh, uh, sort of effect that we see to the right. And what that shows is that there is this maxima in drag with, he used real barnacles, at, that occurs with, at about 75% coverage. We haven't gotten that heavy yet. We hope to, to fill this in, but you can see that the shape of these two are not really mimicking each other. So there's some difference here in, in, in the results of what Kemp had. The other thing was, is we took McDonald's model and it does have a term in to it for the actual drag coefficient of what you're interested in. And I showed earlier for a cube, we changed that for, we measured the drag coefficient on barnacles and we put that in the model. And you see that the shape gets shifted. The McDonald's model predicts a maximum around what, 55%, but our data don't seem to mimic that, uh, that either. The one take home too is that it really doesn't look like this, this model, at least in its present state, is gonna work well for, for trying to predict what the drag on the barnacles are. So there's a marked difference and we're trying to come up with what the reason for that is. One of the ways we've, we've done that and to get more info for the modeling, we've done some detailed flow measurements over real barnacle arrays. So this shows some data from, that we recently got using particle image velocimetry, but I'm not gonna talk too much about what we're getting from that, just able to show some pretty colorful pictures just because I can, right? So what, what don't we know? Well, the one thing I alluded to is that a lot of the work that we did worked on uniform fouling and we very rarely see that or never see that on a ship hull. So then what they showed just notionally some ideas where you could have 8% coverage. So all, th all three of these cases have 8% coverage, but we wouldn't expect that they'd all have the same frictional drag. So how do we deal with that? It was sort of exciting to hear. I visited Nick and Jason up at the uni uh, earlier this week and they're doing some work looking at fundamental roughness work, looking how flows adjust from rough to smooth and smooth to rough, which I think will sort of help us understand this problem to a greater extent. So we don't understand heterogeneity. Uh, we need to work more on that. And I think we're, we're moving in that direction now. Uh, there's just little or no uh, lab data available at this point for that. Uh, we're also interested in these very small coverages because we see very small coverage of calcareous fouling on our ship holes due to like dock blocks and things like that. And so we don't really have a sense of what impact those have. Um, and we'd like to know more. One thing that's sort of exciting too, this is recent results that, uh, that uh, the Melbourne group published. Uh, Jason and his team looked at um, calcareous fouling, but in the, I warned you up front that most of my results were based on what I had in the Chesapeake Bay and our hard fouling is barnacles. But this was for tube worms and this is, has a tube worm plate that's covered with fairly light uh, calcareous fouling and at, at a very low coverage, but it's a FR40. So based on what I had done, based, you know, if you just blindly enter this table, you say, well, that's gonna be, you know, about a KS of uh, equivalent sand roughness height of about a millimeter. Okay? So that's sort of what you'd expect if you just use this. And that would you know, give you a, a penalty on the order of 30%. But what they found was, is that no, lo and behold, this is something more like 300 micron KS. And that the powering penalty you'd expect is gonna be much, much reduced from that. So we're sort of seeing that, you know, the hard soft fouling split is not just you know, this thing that we can just blindly use as a sort of threshold as where we're gonna get these important penalties. So I think we all understand. I think, you know, one thing we do know is that biofouling has significant hydrodynamic penalties. I guess the, 
the devil in the details is that we can't tell you for any exact fouling situation what the exact drag penalty will be. And we need to, to do that, we need to understand spatial and heterogeneity issues. Uh, we need to know more about uh, fouling density and how that affects. And it's not at all clear how differences in communities, okay, will, what role that's going to play. So the, the bottom line take home message is, I think if you're a hydrodynamicist working on this, there's still a lot of, uh, it might not be low hanging fruit, but there's a lot to do. And finally, I'd like to thank the people who made this uh, sort of work possible. Uh, first, the Office of Naval Research, who's funded my work pretty much since I came to the Naval Academy and it's been ongoing and you know, very helpful. I'd like to thank the organizing committee here for inviting me to come. International Paint, was kind enough to paint the, uh, the uh, test plates that we used in the slime uh, fouling experiments. And I'd like to thank, obviously, the people that support in the lab and you guys, colleagues and collaborators that have been great to work with over the years. Thank you.